Hello everyone and welcome to Boundless Dentistry. In this video, we'll talk about some of the basic things that we should know when we're creating or constructing any sort of dental prosthesis and prosthodontics, which are the anatomical landmarks in maxilla because we have to know where each landmark is present so that we can build a prosthesis which is accurately placed inside the mouth without hurting any oral tissues and being of any discomfort for the patient. So in this video, we'll talk about the anatomical landmarks in maxilla. So let's get started. Now, in this picture, you can appreciate that this is a dental cast of an edentulous patient because sometimes we need to build, for example, complete dentures in patients who do not have any teeth in their mouth. So what we do is that firstly, we take an impression of the patient's ridge and then we make a cast. So on this cast, there are some important landmarks that we have to know now. Why do we have to know these landmarks? Because when we know these landmarks, we can build an intraoral prosthesis which is in harmony with the other intraoral structures. For example, buccal mucosa, tongue, and one or two teeth depending on whether they are present in the patient's mouth or not. Other than that, an important thing that we should keep in mind is that we shouldn't only replace the teeth which are present in the oral cavity, but we should also preserve the surrounding tissues around the teeth like cheek and tongue, palate and so of the mouth. So we have to preserve these structures because so that they can provide adequate support to the prosthesis. Now, it is very vital for a dentist to know the anatomical landmarks in maxilla as well as in mandible so that a desirable and comforting prosthesis can be built for the patient. And when we preserve the tissues around the teeth, it helps us obtain an optimum support from the supporting tissue so that we can build a prosthesis which can be accurately fit in the patient's mouth so that the prosthesis as well as the tissue, they are harmonious with each other and therefore we achieve and build a prosthesis which is beneficial for the patient. Now, when we talk about anatomical landmarks, whether this is maxilla or mandible, we mainly categorize them into three categories. Firstly, the stress bearing areas, which are also called as supporting structures, although they are basically the same thing. Other than that, we have relief areas and then we have limiting areas. So in this video, we'll talk about these three categories basing on maxilla. So in the maxillary arch, we can divide it into two parts. We can divide it firstly into stress bearing areas, which mainly consist of tuberosity, we have palate and palatal raphe, which are called as primary stress bearing areas as well. The secondary stress bearing areas, we can have ruga and alveolar ridge. Now, second category is relief areas, which are palatal torus, median palatal raphe and fovea palatine. So we'll talk about each of these features in detail now. Now let's firstly talk about maxillary stress bearing areas. Now, these areas bear the maximum force and provide the maximum support for the intraoral prosthesis that we will build. Now, we can divide the stress bearing area into two parts. Firstly is the primary stress bearing area which bears the maximum force and in maxilla, they are mainly maxillary tuberosities and hard palate. For secondary stress bearing areas which provide some support to the um, prosthesis which is mainly alveolar ridges and ruga. Now let's first talk about maxillary tuberosity. Now in this clinical picture you can appreciate that this is an edentulous ridge of a patient showing maxilla. You can appreciate that these round circled areas just posterior to the maxillary third molar we have these bony projections which are called as maxillary tuberosity. Now, these are the primary stress bearing areas and they are present just distal to the alveolar ridge as you can appreciate in this clinical picture as well. Now, it is important to know the significance of maxillary tuberosity. These tuberosities are present just posterior to the last teeth and when we are building a denture, teeth should not be placed over the maxillary tuberosity because this will lead to not being able to close the mouth. So when you we'll place teeth directly over the tuberosity, patient will not be able to close their mouth. So this is an important thing we should keep in mind now. Another clinical significance is that sometimes in patients, these tuberosities can be hypertrophied and they can grow excessively. So 
before constructing a prosthesis surgical reduction of maxillary tuberosity is sometimes required and the main purpose of maxillary tuberosity is because it's the primary stress bearing area it provides maximum retention and support to create an optimum intraoral prosthesis now the second stress bearing area the primary stress bearing area in maxilla is called as hard palate as you can see in this diagrammatic picture we have hard palate and just posterior to hard palate then we have soft palate so the second primary stress bearing area in maxilla is hard palate now hard palate normally forms when the palatine shelves they basically approximate towards each other and they form the mid palatal suture so that is where the suture is present now the hard palate basically forms the basal seat area where the dentures base seats and provides the primary support for the intraoral prosthesis now after talking about the primary stress bearing area of the maxilla let's talk about secondary stress bearing area of maxilla as you can see in this clinical picture you can see that this is an edentulous maxilla of a patient which is showing the alveolar ridge so the alveolar ridge is the secondary stress bearing area now mainly we have alveolar process which holds the teeth when they are present in the oral cavity and they are teeth depending structure so when teeth are lost from the oral cavity the alveolar process as you can see it dissolves and leaves a remnant so these remnants basically form the alveolar ridge now the alveolar ridge whether it's mandible or maxilla it undergoes variable resorption in some areas it undergoes very high resorption and some area is going to go minimal resorption now the crest as you can see this area of the alveolar ridge it provides secondary stress bearing area for the intraoral prosthesis now the second secondary stress bearing area for the maxilla is the palatal rugae as you can appreciate that these horizontal swellings which you can appreciate just posterior to the maxillary central incisor these are the secondary stress bearing area now these are dense connective tissue projection as you can see on this hard palate in the dental cast of the patient they are present on the anterior third of the hard palate as you can appreciate in this diagrammatic picture now the significance of this palatal ruga is basically that they are associated with phonetics because pronouncing some words this palatal ruga helps a lot it also increases the surface area for the retention of denture so that we can have a good retention which is the most one of the most important feature for a intraoral prosthesis and basically it helps to stabilize the denture foundation so this is all about maxillary stress bearing area we have talked about primary and secondary so let's now move on towards these relief areas now moving on towards relief areas relief areas basically in maxilla consist of incisive papilla mid palatal raphi torus palatalis any sharp bony prominence and fovea palatae now relief areas basically are those areas which should be given space in the maxillary denture so that they do not press against these um, structures because if they press against it there will be difficulty in retention and support so we have to provide relief when we are taking impression in these areas or even surgically reduce some of these areas so that we can have a proper base on which denture seat so let's talk about these relief areas in detail now now let's talk about incisive papilla one of the first relief area in the maxillary denture as you can appreciate in this clinical picture we have the ridge we have hard palate as you can see and just posterior to the maxillary central incisor you can appreciate this little swelling which is present this is called as incisive papilla this is a relief area we have to relieve this area because if pressure exerts on this region it can lead to pain because nasopalatine nerves and vessel passes through this point so we have to relieve this area so that patient doesn't feel pain and discomfort while the dentist seats now it's a fibrous tissue as you can appreciate in this clinical picture and as i've talked before it's an orifice which forms the opening for nasopalatine nerves and vessels now the significance as i've also discussed is it exerts pressure if it's not relieved while taking a dental impression which can lead to discomfort and pain for the patient hence relief should be given at incisive papilla now moving on towards the second relief area in the maxilla which is called as mid palatal suture as you can see in the similar clinical picture this area where the two palatine shelves they join together forms the mid palatal suture and it's just a slight elevation as you can also feel in your mouth so 
this is a significant structure because since it's slightly elevated if it's not if the not provided relief during dental impression it can lead to a bit dislodging of the denture that that is one of the important points that you should keep in mind while taking dental impressions so the mid palatal suture is a relief area where the two palatine shells they join together and the significance is that sometimes it is a bit mobile and can be firm so it can lead to rocking of the denture so relief should be provided while we are taking dental impression now the third area which should be provided relief is called as torus palatalis basically these torus patterns as you can see in this clinical picture you can appreciate the ridge and just at the mid palatal suture you can see that there is slight elevation you can see it's it's it's, it's basically bony exotosis as in some kind of ele um, elevation of the bone and it it can be small as as long as it can also be large so this is something we should keep in mind because as you can see it's very obvious that if you try to see the denture it will not see it because of this very huge swelling so this is an important area where relief should be provided these are bony projection and it may interfere with seating of the denture so at times when relief cannot be provided during dental impression so we have to undergo surgical procedure so that we can reduce this area before we even start to begin making a denture so this is an important clinical finding which you should keep in mind another area which sometimes and you should keep in mind because this is something which isn't easily appreciated while we are taking dental impression is the fovea platini as you can see in this cast as well as in clinical picture there are two openings just posterior you can just posterior to you can say soft palate and just anterior to the anterior vibrating line these are these two openings so relief should be provided because at times it can lead to discomfort for the patient and they are present on either side of the midline so this is an clinical finding which you should keep in mind and relief should be provided whenever it is possible now so far we've discussed stress bearing areas we've also discussed relief areas now let's talk about limiting areas limiting areas basically they form the limits as to how far the dental prosthesis should extend it consists of labial frenum labial vestibule buccal frenum buccal vestibule posterior palatal seal anterior vibrating line and posterior vibrating line so let's talk about them one by one in detail now in this clinical picture you can appreciate that this is a patient's mouth and you can see this attachment starting from the upper lip to just above the maxillary central incisor this is called as labial frenum and when we make dentures as you can see that there is a notch and this notch basically helps to accommodate the labial frenum because if you don't accommodate this labial frenum while you will see the denture and patient opens their mouth the denture will come out because of the pressure exerted by labial frenum so this is something which you should keep in mind so labial frenum is a limiting area which extends from the mucus lining of the upper lip to the crest of the alveolar ridge it can sometimes be single broad or sometimes it can be wider as well so it varies from patient to patient now there are no significant muscle attachment over here so it's just a fibrous tissue which is present over here now it initially starts like fan shape and then it converges at is, as it reaches the alveolar ridge now when we talk about clinical consideration as i've talked before it can interfere with the denture seating and while patient is performing normal um, activities such as speaking opening the mouth wide so it can lead to dislodgement so you have to make sure that the notch is incorporated in your final prosthesis so that the denture doesn't get dislodged and sometimes when this labial frenum is very close to the ridge so at times phrenectomy is also performed in order to reduce the labial frenum now the second limiting area is called as labial vestibule now labial vestibule is just basically a space which is present from labial frenum up to buccal frenum it's just a space you can see it's like a space which is present between the labial and buccal frenum this is called as labial vestibule you can also call it as labial sulcus so it's a limiting area which basically incorporates the labial flange of the denture so it extends on the either side of labial frenum and the labial vestibule basically reflects the height of labial flange of the denture as to how far below it should go below the alveolar ridge now if you talk about clinical consideration we have to take a good impression so that we can effectively record the um, height of vestibule so that we can establish a good height of labial flange of the denture so this is something we should keep in mind while we are taking dental impressions now 
Like labial frenum, there is also something which is called as buccal frenum. It's present near the posterior teeth as you can see in this clinical picture. These are called as buccal frenum. So this is the limiting area which extends till the end of labial vestibule. So it's a mucous membrane and it also attaches close to the alveolar ridge just like labial frenum. So one significance of buccal frenum is that orbicularis oris, it pulls the frenum forward and the buccinator muscle pulls the frenum backwards. So this is one thing we should keep in mind. As you can see in this picture as well, so you have to place a notch in just like labial frenum in order to incorporate buccal frenum. Now, the clinical significance of buccal frenum is that relief should always be provided whenever it's possible in the dental procedure because normally patient while doing their own normal activity, the denture can be dislodged. So this is something you should keep in mind. Now, just like labial sulcus, we also have something which is called as buccal sulcus, which extends just posterior to the buccal frenum and it's a limiting area. It's bounded anteriorly by buccal frenum, laterally we have buccal mucosa and medially we have this alveolar ridge. Now, Buccal vestibule varies in size because as buccinator muscle acting, so it can be either deep and sometimes shallow as well. Now, when we are taking dental impression, we have to make sure to record the buccal vestibule properly so that that determines the proper height of buccal flange of denture. And we do that by asking the patient to open their mouth just half, not completely closed, half closed in order to record the height of buccal vestibule properly. Now, just posterior to the soft palate or close to soft palate, we have a structure which is called as posterior palatal seal. As you can see in this clinical picture, anteriorly to the posterior palatal seal, we have anterior vibrating line and posterior to the posterior palatal seal, we have something which is called as posterior vibrating line. So, it's a limiting area and it is also called as post dam area and post palatal seal as well. Now, it's an area which is present between soft and hard palate and Basically, when pressure is exerted over here, good retention of the denture can be accomplished and this is something which is very important because recording posterior palatal seal area is of utmost importance because this helps very much in denture retention. Now, boundaries as we have talked before, we have anterior vibrating line, posterior vibrating line, pterygo maxillary notch laterally. So, this is, some, this is an important area which you should always keep in mind while taking dental impressions. Now, like we have talked before, we have anterior vibrating line as well as you can see in this clinical picture. It's a limiting area and it is bow shaped. As you can see in this clinical picture, it's an imaginary line present just close to hard palate and it is located by Valsava maneuver where we ask the patient that the both nostrils should be held firmly and the patient blows through their nose. So when this happens, this area is slightly elevated and this helps us recognize that this is anterior vibrating line. Another way is when we ask the patient to produce the R sound. So that also helps to delineate where this anterior vibrating line is present. Now, the last structure, the limiting structure that we'll discuss is the posterior vibrating line, which is a limiting area and imaginary line at the junction of tensor villi palatini and muscular portion of soft palate, which is this. So this is where the posterior vibrating line is present and it's also similarly located when patient says the word ah, so that is where it can be located. Now, the significance is that denture should not be extended posterior to posterior vibrating line because if it does, it can lead to gag reflex. It can also lead to food accumulation just beneath the denture. So it should never extend beyond posterior vibrating line. It should be present just at or a little bit ahead the posterior vibrating line because this will lead to decrease in gag reflex, decrease food accumulation and Lastly, excellent retention when properly achieved through dental impression. So this is something we should always keep in mind. So in this video, we talked about in detail everything that is related to anatomical landmarks of maxilla. We started off by talking um, stress bearing areas, then we talked about the relief areas, then we talked about limiting areas. So this is all something we should always keep in mind while studying landmarks in prosthodontics because this will help you achieve a prosthesis which is in good retention, support and stabilize as well. So I hope this video was useful for you and if you like this video, please like, share, subscribe and press the bell icon. Thank you for watching this video. See you next time.